Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday night Electronics Bash Fundamentals of Arduino stream. I Fundamentals of Arduino stream. Wow, that's what 20 weeks of live Arduino lessons gets you. No, of course, because this weekend we are changing course. Um, we are going to start on a new series of talking about things, having spent the last 20 weeks talking about Arduino and Arduino programming and fundamentals of electronics. Starting this week, we're going to talk about the Raspberry Pi single board computer, um, which I'm super excited about. As always, we're going to give uh, stragglers just a few minutes to join us before um, we kick off uh, talking about Raspberry Pis for the evening. Um, if you uh, if you haven't been here before, all of the slides that we're going to use tonight um, and all of the code that we would normally write in a given evening um, will be on my website, which is over here, jeff.glass slash electronics bash. You can find the link to uh, this week's lesson. Um, all the slides, all the links are there. I know that can be easier to follow along the slides locally rather than viewing them um, on, on the stream. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Chris is here for the pie. Yes, it's true. I tried to find a a, um, a raspberry beer to go with this week, but was pretty unsuccessful. Um, at least our local grocery store, it really needs a, a liquor store touch. Speaking of, because um, I know people, I know, I know inquiring minds want to know, this week I am drinking a Stone IPA from Stone Brewing Company. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about that. Travis can put that in our, uh, in our spreadsheet for us. But raspberry is very seasonal for beers. Yeah, I agree, Chris, for sure. Ooh, did you see that tasteful little loading screen that happened there? Little, little behind the curtain thing. So, this week and for future weeks, we're going to be talking about Raspberry Pi. And so, of course, I have the Raspberry Pi's desktop being captured into my streaming software. Um, but I've actually hit the limit of how many devices can be input at any given time. Um, so I'm, I'm having the program switch back and forth to be whether it's recording this camera, what I look at when I'm you know showing you slides on the computer, and the feed of the Raspberry Pi's desktop itself. So if you if from time to time you see those little loading bars pop up, that's just it's switching back and forth between a couple of inputs. So far, it seems to be working okay. Um, the the general rule of thumb, thumb that I found for streaming input devices is uh, have everything, all of your inputs turned on, and then start the software. So the fact that at some point tonight we're going to be powering the Pi down and booting it back up, and you know causing the HDMI connection to drop and come back is going to be. Uh, kind of exciting from a streaming perspective, um, but I'm excited about it. I, I think this will be a fun, a fun chance to learn a little bit more about the technology on the streaming end of things for me, and a really cool chance to talk about some new technology related to Raspberry Pis for y'all. So that'll be a good time. Chris, what are you drinking this week? Are you are you in hydration mode? I should have said, as always, hydration is just as important as uh, as drinking a beer on a Sunday night. I like to have a beer when I'm doing these things, um, but that's of course always always no no pressure to anybody else. Um, we'll give people who are who are catching up to us just uh, just one more minute here um, before we dive into our topic, which is what what is a Raspberry Pi? Um, we're kind of gonna start start back at the beginning of things um, and talk a little bit about. I'll I'll do the I'll do I have that whole outline in the slide. We'll get there in a second. I'm gonna crack this beer. I've disabled my mute key, so as again, I'll be I'll be manually muting myself to avoid some of the chaos um, that happened in the past few weeks when I was trying to play with that mute button. Yeah, just a tasty bitter IPA. Like, what's not to like? Um, super, super tasty. Yeah, this will be fun. It's fun. I had I changed over a bunch of what's sitting on the workbench below me here. I mean, right now, as you can tell, there's just a keyboard sitting in front of me that's going to be interfacing um, to uh, to the Raspberry. What temp should the oven be preheated to for the pie? Chris, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Let's start. Let's start a tally. How many Raspberry Pi jokes can we get through in a given week? And I feel like each week we can try and like we can try and top ourselves. Um, I was warned that while it probably won't happen today, at some point in this series, my wife Mary, who guessed guessed it in a, in a Arduino centric episode, may be surprising me with a Raspberry Pi at some point in time. Um, it's going to be a whole lot of a whole lot of fun. But on that note, I see our time has expired. Let's just get into it. I think it's going to be a fun and breezy night. Um, we get to get, get excited all over again about some brand new technology that we haven't talked about before. So, what is Raspberry Pi? <laughs> Uh, so tonight, we're going to talk about a few things. Um, we're going to talk about what is a Raspberry Pi, what is it useful for, like what can you do with it, um, how is it different from an Arduino, um, and that's mostly because I mean, they're not, at the end of the day, all that similar, but you hear them talked about in the same breath a lot. You know, you hear somebody say, oh, I'm going to build um, a robotic traffic light that tases people. I'm going to do that with, I don't know, an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Why are those two things sort of brought up in, in conjunction with each other so much? Um, and we want to, of course, talk about how they're the same, how they're different, and where to start with a Raspberry Pi. Um, I should hope after the past... We have, wait, what? Oh, 
oh, something strange has happened. I see. We're in we're slides over here today. So you're gonna see a little a little bit of ear cam. Ooh. Palmer's been on for a while, but on his fire TV stick. Ooh, I feel so classy. Look at so fancy, so classy. Um well I guess I've 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 shenanigans my my slides a little bit, but I think I can like, do it here. Sorry for the the side view here. Um but let's just dive in. What is a Raspberry Pi? Well, uh it's it's a uh, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll just pull one out. Um you as you saw earlier. Um, when we show here, or as I, I pull up this desktop, this might look very much like a computer desktop, like your Windows or Mac desktop. And that desktop is being provided by, if I switch to my table cam here, this. This is my little Raspberry Pi. This is a little Raspberry Pi 4. There are multiple versions, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the Raspberry Pi and all of its friends and its sort of similar derivatives and various families of things are what we would call a single board computer. And you can kind of see why. You know, I have a device that has things you would think about when you're thinking about a computer system. It's got USB ports. It's got an Ethernet jack or an 8P8C jack. It's got an 8th uh, inch analog audio output a couple of these are mini hdmi ports so they're just like full-size hdmi ports but smaller um, a little USB-C power jack here for shooting power into it the little sd card in the back for some storage and then a bunch of connectors that you don't normally see I, I assume you don't normally see on your desktop pc or on your laptop but in many ways like this this is the whole computer that's providing this desktop environment that looks, you know, just kind of like the desktop on my PC that I'm streaming this from. So a Raspberry Pi at its core is a single board computer. I'm going to do most of the waving around from now on with this other one that I happen to have just because it's not actually connected to a thing. So I can turn it over and, and mess with it without worrying about something coming disconnected. Um, so yeah, so everything that is making up what is, you know, running a computer desktop background is running on one of these little boards. So Raspberry Pi at its heart is a single board computer. Um, in about 2012, so, you know, not that many years after the Arduino project got rolling, um, some folks over in the UK said, hey, it would be great uh, if we could have a small, low-cost, uh, you know, miniaturized computer system. They were thinking of it for classrooms. Like, hey, it would be awesome to be able to have a computer lab where the computers themselves didn't cost you know, $500 a piece or the $300 that we're used to throwing at Apple for our computer labs every year. We want to get this as cheap as possible. So they launched, and you can see a picture of it here, the Raspberry Pi 1A, which retailed for like $30, $35. Instant hit, immediately sold out all over the world, ran millions and millions of them. Um, and since then, they've been iterating on this a similar form factor of board, this same little, you know, sort of large credit card sized board um, while really trying to keep the price down. Um, up until like the most current generation, these were like 30 or $35. The reason that you can actually get a more expensive one now is you have different options for how much RAM is on these. Yes, RAM, just like you would have inside of your actual, you know, your actual computer. Um, you can now get ones with two or four or eight gigabytes of RAM. I think the eight gigabyte one retails for something like $80, which is still a stupidly low price for a full computer setup. Um, but the, the the canonical price, the two gigabyte price, the base price is still like thirty five dollars, which is which is just awesome. Um, so uh, th you know, as you can imagine, with these things being so widespread, there's a bunch of different things you can do with them. And before we sort of dive into the like a, a little bit deeper into the what is it and how you get started categories, I thought I would just blast through a bunch of like interesting categories of projects that people have done with this thing over the past eight years to really get the juices flowing for like what you could do with this thing. So, uh, so some, some things you could do with a Raspberry Pi, a not exhaustive list. Um, you could use it, kind of like I'm using it today, as a desktop computer setup. You hook it up to a mouse and a keyboard and a monitor, and you have a little computer. And of course, you know, when, we, when we're when we talking very proudly about this $30, $35 price point, you know, we're, we're throwing a monitor at it and a keyboard and a mouse, and suddenly the whole computer setup starts to look a little bit more expensive than it once did. Um, but presumably, you know, you might have these things sitting around already, or a, you know, a used HDMI monitor from a few years ago might be 20 or 40 bucks. And, you know, if you have wanted to experiment under the hood with these computers, you wouldn't be burning a new monitor and keyboard every time you were swapping in an actual computer itself. Um, let's see, other things you might do. 
Um, so once you have a computerized environment running with a screen, a very popular thing to do is to make a digital wall calendar. So this is basically, you know, a computer, your, your Raspberry Pi running an app or running your Google Calendar or something, uh, but uh, stapled to a monitor on your wall. Um, and this is sort of fits into the category of things that like, you know, under the hood, you're really just running a website or an app on a computer. But because the computer itself is so inexpensive, you can afford to dedicate a computer to a, a singular application like this. You know, there's no way in the world I would take my $100 laptop um, and staple it to the wall just to give myself a digital calendar. But if I had, you know, like a $30 monitor that I got used and a little $35 uh, computer and a cable to hook the two of them together. So now we're talking like 80 bucks for a, a digital wall calendar or say a digital weather station um, that sits on the wall or something that, you know, maybe I only use it to, I need a stock ticker on my wall. I really like watching the stock market. I just want to have the Bloomberg website pulled up all day long. You know, with a price point of under $100 for the whole setup, now it starts to seem more plausible that we could dedicate a, a computer to some of these tasks. Um, a little deeper down that rabbit hole, a lot of people use the Raspberry Pi and its derivatives for video game emulation. So there's a few examples up, up on the screen here um, from folks who basically either run an emulator in a computer-like environment or build a Raspberry Pi into something that looks like a video game console. Um, the SNES has, has some pretty good emulators um, on Raspberry Pi or a little tiny you know, miniature console, a little miniature Game Boy-like form factor might be a fun thing to have. Um, so video game creation is a is a cool idea, is a, a thing that a lot of people have used the Raspberry Pi for. Um, ooh, Chris says calendar is a cool idea. Thinking about a message center for my house, yeah, totally. So the same way that like you know on your on your Mac, I imagine you might have like sticky notes on your on your desktop. You could have a sticky notes app running on your on your Pi, um, and maybe it's something like Remember the Milk, which is an app that like has sticky notes and then syncs them across the internet. So you you know you take them on your phone while you're out, and then you get home later and you're like, oh, what was that thing? Oh, it's automatically appears on this screen that's permanently on my wall, right? There's things you can start to do when you have a computer that's cheap enough that you can put it anywhere. Um, other things you might do, this is something I actually use a Raspberry Pi for in my in my home workshop here, um, is 3D printer control. Um, so uh, the, the Pi basically sits next to my printer and sends it little serial commands to control its motion. Um, but what's nice about that, you know, that, that's something that the printer could do on its own. You can give it a file on an SD card and it will just print it for you. Um, but once you have an actual computer hooked up to the printer, now you can do things like send it files over the web, do remote monitoring, hook a webcam directly up to it. So you can say, hey, uh, I want to look exactly at what my 3D printer is doing now. And if necessary, you know, log into my, my web server from the office and say, oh, that doesn't look good. Uh, cancel, please. And send my printer a stop message from wherever I am in the universe. Um, that's a pretty, a pretty cool system. If you want to look into that, um, Octoprint is the program and there's actually a distribution called Octopi, um, that makes it really, really easy to install. Um, just like, just like spinning the wheels here, just to like give you a sense of like the, the breadth of things you might do with this. And we're not, we're not done with this category by any means. I just want to like, you know, we'll get into the, how you get started and, and more details about what it is. I just want to get those imagination juices flowing. Um, so other things you could do, you could build escape rooms with a Raspberry Pi. Here's a, a couple of examples that I, I borrowed from some Raspberry Pi magazines that we'll talk about in a little bit. These are also the kind of projects that you could be easily build with an Arduino. You can see buttons and switches and displays and things that probably make sound and things like that. So you could do these with an Arduino as well, but there's no reason you can't build them with a Raspberry Pi. Um, that kind of interactivity is cool. And especially if you were thinking about networking a couple of devices directly together, something like a Raspberry Pi that has connectivity that has Ethernet and Wi-Fi built in might be a really cool option. Um, here's like, now to get into like some more cherry-picked esoteric examples, um, here's somebody who made a Mount Kilimanjaro climbing progress tracker for his family um, and actually has made a few of these similar projects. This is from someone who was an avid mountain climber and wanted to provide a very direct feedback method for his family and especially his kids for him to have a sense of, you know, where was he on the mountain as he's climbing? Um, so they can kind of look over at a physical installation and say, oh, you know, dad's right there. So what he did is he uh, he was wearing a sort of GPS-enabled emergency phone already that was sort of uh, at regular intervals sending out his GPS coordinates via satellite to a central server. And then he had a Raspberry Pi sitting in his living room underneath this 3D-printed structure uh, that would periodically pull the server and say, hey, where is the where is this GPS coordinates right now? 
And if it was close enough to a, a preset singular location, it would then light up one of these, you know, half dozen LEDs that represented different camps and different stages of his climb of Kilimanjaro. Super cool, right? So the output side of things, right, is not super complicated. You're lighting or not lighting some LEDs, but the ability for the Raspberry Pi to, much like a computer, reach out to the internet and, and pull down data is what sort of makes this project possible. Um, you could you go super intense on the build side of things. Um, there's folks who have built a model Mars rover for educational purposes centered around a Raspberry Pi. So the Pi is handling remote control. It's handling motor driving and all the sort of kinematics related to that. It's handling, I think, a little bit of the monitoring of the solar charging that's going on with the rover and also the camera system and, and distance sensors that sit on top of it here. So just, a, again, a cherry-picked example, but, like, it's all running off of a little tiny... $35 computer that looks just like this one. That's pretty cool. Ooh, Chris mentions ad blocker. We're, we're going to get there in just a second, I'm sure. Um, one more sort of kinematic example um, is this cool tie and weather clock um, that was featured in, in Magpie magazine recently, um, where someone basically pulled down weather data from a, web, a website on the internet and then had a number of actuators control these laser cut wood. These It's just beautiful. Um, laser cut wood implements to indicate the the current weather uh, and the current state of the tides because this, this person's hobby or work required them to know when the, when the low tide was that day so or maybe they could go tide pooling out in the waves um, and so they made this really cool implementation where you can you know sort of see at a glance what is the temperature what is the weather and what is the state of the tides that's pretty cool um the Raspberry Pi is, you know, at its heart, is just a, a computer like any other computer, your laptop, your desktop, your phone, really, these days that you might be familiar with. And so in addition to acting as a user interface device, it can act as a little, a little mini server, a little mini thing that sits on your network and hands off files or data or responds to information that you ask from it. Um, one of the common uses is as a media server. So you could have the Raspberry Pi with some additional storage, maybe an external hard drive or two, sitting somewhere on your network. And then you could have a program, say, on a computer hooked up to your television or uh, an app on your phone, stream movies, music, content files from your little local media server directly to your device, rather than streaming them over the internet, say from Netflix or Hulu or something like that, having a local repository of all of your media so you can put it wherever in your house or in your life you want it. Um, if you wanted to look into that more, Plex is a really common system for doing it, but there's a few different environments for media servers now. Um, and then as Chris mentions, oops, as Chris mentions, um, you can use it as an ad blocker. So uh, the pie hole, as in shut your pie hole, um, is a pretty common software for doing ad blocking on your network. You basically, you hook that Raspberry Pi up to your network and you um, configure your, your network, your computer to, to route all requests for internet resources through the Raspberry Pi. Um, and it maintains a master list of sources of things that are pretty much guaranteed to just be sources of ads coming down onto your website, down to you know, whatever website you're trying to view. And uh, when your, you know, your Chrome, your Firefox, your Internet Explorer requests a website and gets, you know, the text and the header and the background and the formatting um, and, you know, six or seven or eight ads, the Pi hole will block the request for those ads, but allow the website to come through. Um, so you sort of get a little network wide ad blocker within your local area network. So this is just to give you like a flavor of, you know, we looked, there's a lot of those examples that flew by that were sort of physical interactive devices, but as a, you know, a cheap computerized device, you can use it as a little, a little server, um, a little server of sorts or a little network attached device of sorts. Um, Palmer says, do the websites detect the software? Depends on the website. Um, I would think, I, I'm not super duper familiar with how Pi-hole actually works, um, but uh, presumably you, you could have a structure wherein you could check, um, as Chris says, if there's an ad blocker, like they could, you know, ask the, ask to load the ad and then do some checking maybe in JavaScript to see if the ad was actually loaded. Um, but in general, it's, it's not terribly problematic, not more so than like any ad blocker on your computer would be. Um, we have one more example. Oh, a couple more examples. Um, so speaking of like cheap computer devices to throw at things, lots of folks have messed around with doing computing clusters out of Raspberry Pis. Um, so networking, you know, half a dozen or a dozen or two dozen Raspberry Pis together. Not so much that you, like, you know, are building the world's best supercomputer out of Raspberry Pis, but just as a little learning environment to get used to, you know, what does it look like to solve uh, a computational problem in a distributed environment? You know, um, this would be for something like, you know, if you're, if you're working in data science or you're working in 
um, network study or you're working in mathematics, uh, you might be tasked with or might find the use of saying, hey, I, I can't solve this problem running a program on just my computer. I want to run it on a network of hundreds of computers, all of which take a little piece of the puzzle and try and solve it on their own. Um, that kind of system, if you don't have access to one to work with, can be kind of intimidating. And so building one of these you know, little micro clusters to play with um, play with various softwares and networking architectures can be a cool way to sort of get your feet wet with a, you know, a, a couple hundred dollars worth of hardware in a little micro cluster. Um, you could also use this as a playground for um, working with like networking protocols, right? If you were not, not super duper familiar with how, you know, networking was flowing, maybe having eight computers that are all under your control and you're hooked up to a switch that you have all right in your desktop, you can simulate a little networking environment and watch the packets flow back and forth and, and see what happens. So a, a neat application of just, again, just having like cheap computers you can throw into a pile and do something with. Um, and then, you know, going back to like the roots of the Raspberry Pi project, it's a cheap computer that can be used as an education tool, both about programming, which is kind of what, you know, one of the things that we'll be using it for, or um, as just as how to use a computer. You know, um, there are some environments that are specifically designed for setting up a, a network of Raspberry Pis uh, in a classroom, right? So we can basically have, you know, a bunch of monitors sitting there with a Raspberry Pi glued to the back, keyboard and mouse, and a Raspberry Pi that the teacher is using to sort of monitor and control and update all of these students, all of these sort of remote Raspberry Pis. And suddenly now we're looking at a whole computer lab that's, you know, instead of being tens of thousands of dollars, it's a thousand dollars or two thousand um, dollars. So there's there's lots of applications where using the Raspberry Pi specifically in an, in an education setting um, is, is sort of forward put. Um, things that make programming more approachable, things that make accessing the internet and email more approachable are, are central to what the software that's already on the Pi is. Um, so th again, this is just kind of a cherry picked, like I, I just like scrolled through some places I like on the internet and was like, ooh, that's a cool thing. You could oh, that's a cool, oh, we should talk about that. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, you start to get a sense of like, all the various parts of, you know, maybe you just get your juices flowing, you know, like Chris's message center, or, you know, maybe it was like, oh, what if I, what, if, what could I do if I had a, had a computer, you know, on the wall of my living room? And what if it, what if it could have lights attached to the outside of it that I could control, or maybe a servo motor that I could control, or a button attached to it that when I pressed it did something out over the internet for me? You know, maybe uh, a device that whenever I press a button, it tweets for me, uh, hey, I'm home, or something like that, which might be a bit of a security flaw now that I think about it, but um, but things like that would be cool. Or maybe a device that whenever it senses motion on its attached webcam, uh, takes a picture and sends you an email of what it sees, right? Um, might be a thing you you could do with a Raspberry Pi. Um, so yeah, so just like just to start start things flowing along here. Um, those are just some, some cool sample projects. I should I should plug at this point, I should mention again later, um, a lot of these examples come from a magazine called Magpie, M-A-G-P-I. It's a free zine. You can find it for free on the internet. You can also pay for a subscription if you want the print version. But a really cool way to get some access to uh, some of the current content is, and I put a link to this in the description of this stream and or video, um, right now Humble Bundle, um, who specializes in sort of group inexpensive uh, software and literature purchases. That's an awful description of what they do. They basically are a deal site. They have like, you know, maybe a dozen deals every week where they package a bunch of like software together and say, hey, pay what you want for this pile of Bioware games or this pile of comics. And this week, I think up until like tomorrow at noon, so if you're watching this live, you're getting it under the wire, there is a pile of Raspberry Pi related books and magazines available on Humble Bundle. I think if you pay anything, you get like eight or nine and if you pay the, the the maximum tier which is like 15 bucks you get like 30 different pdfs of magazines and books getting started with raspberry pi for c for python a bunch of issues of magpie um so anyway if you're interested in like checking out some of these things and looking at some of these projects that's a cool that's a cool <laughs> serendipity that that happens to be available this week um obviously i'm not like sponsored or connected i just think that's a cool a cool resource to go and dig through and be like ooh that's cool. Ooh, that's a thing I could do. So anyway, that link in the description may be worth uh, checking out if you're watching this live or within 12 hours of it going up. Yeah. Questions so far? I need a quick beer break, um, and then I want to dive into a little bit more about what the Raspberry Pi is and how it compares to Arduino. That is dangerously drinkable. That's really smooth. 
Chris says, can we use frozen raspberries? Ooh, that's actually, Chris, it's funny you should say that um, because heat can be a little bit of a concern with a raspberry pie. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit when we talk about necessary parts. Um, but I have sitting in front of me here, I actually have a little tiny heat sink um, that is meant to go on my Raspberry Pi's processor uh, that I haven't applied yet. Um, but it is, it's noticeably warm. Chris, you were here ages ago when we did a, a heat test on some LEDs and I burned myself. So if we're lucky, maybe we'll get to go back to some of that excitement again. So let's talk a little bit about um, the connectivity on a Raspberry Pi and, and you know how you can hook things up to it um, and what you might what you might do with it. Because really, in uh, <laughs> no fire tonight, Chris, not on purpose anyway. Um, really, the things you can do with a Raspberry Pi are, are pretty amazing. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to do this on the, the physical version here. Um, so, oh, I should say, um, we didn't really talk too much about Raspberry Pi versions. The version that I'm going to be using for all of my demos in the coming weeks is the newest version. This is a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, all the versions, the mainline versions are all pretty similar. They differ primarily in the connectors that they have. So, for example, um, this Raspberry Pi 4 has two of these micro HDMI connectors here. This little, uh, I think this is a, a 2B, a two, uh, you know, a 2 Bravo version that I have here, has one full-size HDMI connector. Um, and a, a different processor, an older generation processor, is the primary difference between them. Um, but as I'm showing you the examples, just know that like these, this information pertains to pretty much any model, just with some differences in connectors that they've improved over time. Right? So on your Raspberry Pi, you have an Ethernet connector, an RJ45 connector. On the older models, it was a 10 or 100 megabit connection. On the Raspberry Pi 4, you actually get gigabit Ethernet, so up to 1,000 a, a bits per second, which is pretty cool. Um, you get, on the Raspberry Pi 3, you get 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. On the Raspberry Pi 4, you get 2.4 and 5 gigahertz dual band Wi-Fi, pretty fancy. You also get Bluetooth in the version 4. I think you had that in version 3 as well, but that I'm not 100% sure of. Like I say, this is a 2. Um, you get at least one HDMI output. In this case, so on the 2, it was a full-size HDMI. On the 4 that we looked at, it was a micro HDMI. And on these Pi Zeros that we'll talk about a little bit later, it's a mini HDMI. So if you're not following along directly with the, like, the, the parts list that I put together, um, just get the right cable for the thing that you have, I guess would be the strongest thing. Um, I also have a 3.5 millimeter audio out here. So just that's like a standard headphone jack output for connecting to headphones or speakers. Um, we get four USB ports on all the mainline boards. These are on the two and three. These are USB 2.0 ports. The Pi 4 has uh, two USB 3.0 ports. So those are high speed ports, which is great. I guess, uh, sorry, they are USB 3.0 ports. High speed ports is another thing in USB land. Um, uh, and then, so you get a few other things, right? You get a, a place to put an SD card for your operating system and storage. And we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Um, and then we have this this 40 pin connector right here, um, which is generally called the GPIO connect, the general purpose input and output connector, or sometimes just the Raspberry Pi header connector, because they kind of made this standard up and a lot of people have copied it. So it's just sort of turned up to be standard for now. Um, there's also a couple of these flat connectors here, one of which is meant for a, a specific camera module that you can add to your Raspberry Pi. I mean, one is meant for a specific display module, like a small touchscreen display you can add to the top of the Pi. That's in addition to the um, the HDMI output. Um, yeah, Chris, it's, in, it's totally wild that this whole thing is only... 35 bucks. Um, I, I genuinely am shocked every time I, I put my hands on one. I actually have the old, an old model, model one here. Um, it's a model, it's a model one B, um, with an HDMI. So like you can see they haven't changed things terribly much over time. The biggest thing is getting an updated processor with more speed, um, and changing a few connectors around over time. Um, just, I guess to mention it, just cause I've mentioned it, uh, uh, you know, threw it in there for a second. Um, and I mentioned it in the video that went out last week about Raspberry Pi related parts. Um, these are the Raspberry Pi Zero and Zero W. I actually, I actually don't know which one is which because they look so similar. So Zero, Zero W, right? They look pretty much exactly the same. Um, this is a little, a little tiny form factor board that's meant for you know, little embedded applications, right? So. Um, in the case of something like like the you know the calendar that just sits on your wall, their digital calendar, right? That you're probably not going to have a keyboard and mouse hooked up to. You might might make it a touchscreen, or it might just be a display, right? We don't necessarily need 
all of the connectivity that's provided by a big bulky board like this, we could use something like the Pi Zero. Um, and the primary differentiator that you, you know, the benefit you gain from that is price. These, the Pi Zeros, retail for, or at least did when they were new, uh, $5. $5 for this whole microcomputer board. The Zero W, which added Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, is $10. That's crazy. Chris has used a Zero with an Ethernet adapter for Pi Hole totally, right? So on the on the Zero and the Zero W, you, you get a power input, you get one micro USB connector, you need a place for the SD card to go in that holds your operating system, HDMI out, and anything else you want to do has to be done with soldered connections to the Raspberry Pi header here, right? So you could put a USB hub on here and do an ethernet adapter or hook up a you know a mouse and keyboard for troubleshooting you can plug a monitor in and so on um but for applications where you're at the end of the day you're not going to have a ton of interactivity something like these little pi zero and zero w's are a super super cool option um not all of the software that works on the raspberry pi directly and immediately works on the zeros there are some that that don't are not quite the same because the internal hardware is slightly different um, but most programs will sort of just work between the two um, so for the sake of like our our learning things, um, we're going to stick to the mainline series of boards. We're going to work with that Raspberry Pi 4B. Um, at least mine has two gigabytes on it. Um, just because they'll be really handy to have like USB ports and an Ethernet connection and things like that. Um, but just know that those zero Ws are out there because they're a, a super cool option for like making minimized projects. Um, oh, a little thing that's worth mentioning. So speaking of connecting the Raspberry Pi to things, um, much like the Arduino environment has shields, little circuit boards that snap onto the top of your board and provide you easy connectivity to a uh, servo control or displays or audio amplifiers or whatever. In the Raspberry Pi world, the equivalent thing is called a Raspberry Pi hat, um, which would be a, I, I don't have one here. Um, is that true? I was say I don't have one, but I actually... I have, mm, well, I, I don't have one close enough at hand to be able to show you, but um, essentially, right, you would have a circuit board that is the same size as a Pi that snaps in over the top and attaches to the the, uh, the header here that provides you with, you know, some kind of additional functionality. Maybe it's easy servo and motor control. Maybe it's a big old display. Maybe it's an audio amplifier. Um, so that would be a, a Raspberry Pi hat. Um, and then they, the the nomenclature has been, you know, if a, if a hat is the size of a full-size Raspberry Pi, something that's just the size of a little Pi Zero is a bonnet, right? So full-size hat, mini-size bonnet. Pretty adorable. Um, let's see. Uh, exactly the same thing as an Arduino shield, right? And and a lot of other sort of microcontroller environments and small computer environments have adapted this idea of a of a, a hat to snap on top of it. There's an environment that calls them capes. There is, you know, um, add-on boards and various things. Just so if you see like, oh, what is the RGB display hat for Raspberry Pi? It means some kind of circuit board that snaps onto that header that gives you additional functionality. Just wanted you to know that terminology in case you start seeing it out there. Um, and the, the hats of Bonus do all kinds of adorable things. Here's one that has uh, a little mini display on it and a joystick and two buttons, right? So you can make a little tiny, you know, the size of a, a Pi Zero little gaming console that has a little tiny screen and a joystick and buttons. And now you have like a little a little mini Game Boy going on or a little touch screen, right? If you needed some device that needed touch screen functionality in the palm of your hand, this would be a way that you could, you could do something like that. Um, let me take a, a quick beer break as we get into Raspberry Pi versus Arduino, because that's going to be kind of kind of a topic here tonight. But give me give me one second here. Very tasty. Um, actually, before we get into Raspberry Pi versus Arduino, um, I, I was going to do this at the end when we sort of looked at like how to install and get started with the Raspberry Pi operating system. But I actually think we're just going to jump to it now. Um, so we'll show you how to get here in a second here, but this is the desktop of my Raspberry Pi environment. So I've got my my micro HDMI to HDMI cable plugged in here, and just here into the, the HDMI zero port of my Raspberry Pi. I have my, my keyboard and mouse plugged in to a couple of USB ports, and I have my power plugged in. And then just like any other computer, it shows up, you know, on my HDMI monitor, as a uh, as a computer would, and this gives me this desktop environment. So, like I say, we'll take a look at how you you know get to this point in a little bit, and I swear it is not hard. But when you get here, I just want to you know tool around a little bit and show you what this looks like. Um, inside our little Pi menu, which is like your start menu or your applications folder on a Mac, 
we have a variety of, of built-in programming tools, Genie and Thani, to uh, to write programs in and, and do some, some IDE work. We have the Chromium web browser, excuse me, which is uh, much like Chrome. It's a derivative of the Chrome browser. Um, it's a little bit more optimized for the Raspberry Pi environment. It's not going to connect to anything at the moment because I haven't given my the new Pi my Wi-Fi network yet. I'm more hooked it up to an Ethernet cable. But you can see it's, you know, it's just a web browser. It even has the Chrome dinosaur in it. Um, uh, other things we've got, we got a, a media player in our sound folder here. We've got VLC, which will play just about anything. Image viewer, um, some accessories. Um, yeah, Palmer, all of this is free. All this is free software that comes with, uh, that comes with the Raspberry Pi, basically. Um, and I'll show you how to install that in just a little bit. Um, we have a, a text editor, we have our task manager, some diagnostics, a calculator, because every good computer needs a calculator. Um, this is G calculator in our case. It also it not only has normal view, it has scientific mode. So it becomes a bigger calculator. Um, what else have we got in here? You can adjust your preferences, your screen size, and your various things. Um, because it's just some really basic software um, to to get you started. Um, it also has you know it's a trash can for throwing things away. It's got a, a file system, right? So much like your PC or your Mac has has your ho has your files and your user folder. This one has you know a documents folder with nothing in it yet because this is a brand new computer for me. Um, it has your downloads folder. So when we download things from the internet, here here's a folder I uh, a file I downloaded previously. So in many ways, like it is it is a computer like a PC or a Mac, um, just running on a little tiny board that you have full control over. Um, which is super cool. Chris says my time is wrong. Yeah, I guess I haven't set the time yet, but I think I can see. Can I do that now? Yeah. So digital clock settings, uh, top of line. You know, it'll it will automatically set the clock when I connect it to the internet. So that that will probably be my my cheating way of uh, of taking care of that. <laughs> um, like I say, I just did the install on this board I think yesterday, and I haven't finished the setup yet, kind of on purpose and kind of because I'm lazy. Um, so you could see how it works. Um, but just like when I'm saying, like, you know, you can do things on the Raspberry Pi, just imagine that, like, it will give you a desktop environment, much like any other computer. So if you had a computer lab full of computers, you would have a bunch of desktops where kids could write text documents or um, uh, mess around with a free image editor and make pictures or make slideshows in a free alternative to PowerPoint or something like that. So it really is, you know, a pretty powerful little machine for what it's able to do. So it can do all this stuff. It, can, it gives you a desktop. It gives you the ability to work with a keyboard and mouse. There's a few other ways, he said, segueing, that this thing is similar and some ways that it is different to an Arduino, which has been, of course, the subject of our last 20 weeks of chatting. Um, so the Raspberry Pi versus the Arduino, right? So the Raspberry Pi obviously has more built-in connectivity, especially the 4, right? It's got Ethernet built right in. It's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built right in. That's pretty cool. Um, whereas the Arduino, right, has a pretty limited set of ways that it natively can connect to things, right? So it's got our, if we, for those who are just joining us for Raspberry Pi Week, I don't know if there's any of you out there, but if you are, hello, cool, time to jump in. Um, you know, you have your, your various header pins and connections. You have your USB for power and programming and a, a DC jack, right? But everything else you would need connectivity wise, whether it was ethernet or something else would take some, some additional hardware that you'd have to snap on like a shield or build for yourself. Right? When you look at a Raspberry Pi, just the, the, the number of connection options you have is greater on the Pi. Um, the uh, Raspberry Pi runs a full operating system, whereas the Arduino is only running your code. And this is a really important distinction to understand. In fact, it's maybe the major distinction for why you would choose one versus the other. Right? So if we look at this uh, this display that's coming out of my little Pi and into, well, in my case, into a capture card, into my computer, into the monitor and into the internet, right? So um, all of these, all of these pixels, right, that are showing up on the screen, all this functionality, all the fact that I can I can move my my USB mouse and it moves a collection of pixels on the screen that means something. There is code running inside the Raspberry Pi at all times making that happen. Right. And it's it's constantly multitasking a variety of things going on inside the Pi, right? It has the ability to have a menu open and have the mouse move and be you know, playing a movie in a media center and be loading another program. Um, it, it is like like a Windows environment or a Mac environment, a multitasking operating system by its very nature. 
which means that you know it we are constantly running lots of bits of software so that we have the ability to you know, do multiple things at once look at what the mouse is doing play a video file reach out to or receive information from the internet and it's all sort of taking care of us it's taken care of for us so that we as the user don't really need to see exactly what's happening when it all just sort of happens. And that's a huge contrast to something like the Arduino programming environment. I don't think Arduino comes pre-programmed uh, on the Pi anymore, but if it did, it would be a really, we could do our Arduino programming on the Pi. Um, but when we, you know, when we think about our, our Arduino code that we've been writing for the past 20 weeks, um, you know, open up a, a bit of sample code over here. Let's see here do this yeah there we go uh let's just see what have i opened recently tone list that's some code we wrote once right so when i run code like this on an arduino i know that my arduino is running this code and only this code and we spent a ton of time when we were in arduino land saying hey you know make sure your code doesn't take too long because you can only run one bit of code at once and if one bit of code holds you up you won't get to the other bit of code in time and so on you're running exactly this code no more no less um, so in some ways that's really handy because you always know exactly what's going on. And if something doesn't work, well, you have full control over the code itself. Whereas in a Raspberry Pi environment, the advantage that you have is that you, 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 you relinquish some of your control of exactly what's going on to gain the power of having lots of things going on at once taken care of for you. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, as we do more examples, I think it will. Um, the Arduino is faster, I think, to set up just because there's less less capable. Less, I want to. I don't want to say. So here's the thing. I don't want to say that the Arduino is less capable than the Raspberry Pi. They are two different things with two different objectives, right? But I will say that the Arduino is, in many senses, simpler than the Raspberry Pi, which can be an advantage in many situations, right? You don't want to bring. Um, What's a, what's a good analogy here? There's no need to bring the world's fanciest oscilloscope to a problem when a voltmeter would give you the answer because it'll just take longer to set up. There might be settings wrong that you don't know about and you, you might get the wrong information, right? Using the simplest tool for the job can be a real strength, right? And because the Arduino is a simpler controller, it can be faster to set up and easier to debug because you know every bit of code that's running on it whereas on a pi right even you know i i don't know at this point like i could run some code on here that blunk an led blunk <laughs> blunk blinked blinked an led i could run some code on here that blinked an led um but i i still know there's code on here that's like managing this desktop and advancing this little clock even though it's wrong and managing you know constantly looking for internet connections and things like that so i'm never going to know every single bit of code that's running on there um, so that, that may make things difficult to debug if I start relying on some of that functionality. Uh, Chris makes a good analogy. You don't rent a 20 foot truck to pick up a shirt from the department store. Yeah, exactly. Right. Use, I, I'm a huge fan of use the right tool for a job, but use the simplest tool for a job. And so like, you know, in the coming weeks, as we start getting into this, of course, we're going to be using a pretty big hammer to drive some pretty simple nails, right? Using a raspberry Pi to blank an led is like not necessarily you know, a good end use case, but it is a great way to learn about it, right? Like it, sometimes the the reason to drive the 20 foot truck to the department store, which is a metaphor that I'm definitely stealing, Chris, um, there's, there's not really a good reason to do that unless what you're trying to do is learn how to drive a 20 foot truck. In which case, sometimes you just gotta get, on, get out and drive it and doing it on a simple errand means that you are more ready for the more complicated errand later on. That's a good metaphor. <laughs> Did YouTube autocorrect? I know Palmer watches with the captions on. Um, I, I shudder to think what my auto captions look like on this thing. Um, so, so you know, given this like this this rough distinction between what a Raspberry Pi is and what an Arduino is, you know, a Raspberry Pi runs an operating system that does a lot of stuff for us. The Arduino does exactly what we tell it to and only what we tell it to. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a breakdown of the kinds of things that I think, in my opinion, are that would lead me toward a Raspberry Pi-like solution for a problem, and things that would lead me toward an Arduino-like solution for a problem. And I say Arduino-like and Raspberry Pi-like because, you know, as you can imagine, with the success of 
these little you know single board computers uh, there are many more people than just the Raspberry Pi Foundation making things like this these days there's the banana pie and the orange pie and the beagle bone um, and various other single board computer form factors some of which have a, a very similar connection to this some of which are in whole different form factors but you know there are there are other things that are a lot like this that are made by other manufacturers with various target markets you know more processing power less processing power low power um, for display outputs, you know, whatever your sort of target segment is, there's a board out there for you. Um, but they all share this sort of same philosophy of being a, a single board computer versus a microcontroller. So I want to just give you a, a quick overview. Um, uh, Palmer asked a good question. Um, uh, 98% new to Raspberry Pi. Are you going to get into software? Is there an app store? So there is, there is not an app store of sorts as... Um, as we would think of in the world of um, like a, a Mac app store. Um, but just take a, take a quick aside. Um, if you're in your Raspberry Pi operating system, and I, I swear our next thing will be to show you how to get this installed. Um, if you go into preferences and add and remove software, you get a whole list of things that you could potentially install. Um, now, what this doesn't quite do for you in the way that like the Apple you know app store does, oh, this is going to fail because I'm not hooked up to the internet. Um, but maybe maybe I can be hooked. Oh, well, I guess I have a a preliminary package list here. I don't know where that came from. It must be a part of the install now. Um, what this doesn't do for you really is curation, right? In the same way that like, you know, so here's a good example. Um, I'm gearing up to do, we're going to do some programming in Python in the coming weeks as sort of our one of our chosen languages for writing code in the Pi. And I was like, what, what in 2020 is like, what's the good program to write some code in for the Pi. There used to be lots of options. I'm sure there's new options now. What should I write in? Well, you come to the Raspberry Pi add and remove programs thing, and you come to the programming category. Well, it's still updating here, but you can tell, like, there's tons and tons of programming options, um, and what exactly they are is not entirely detailed, so this is more of a tool to say, hey, I found a thing that I googled on the internet. Here's an easy way to install it, rather than, like, a curated app store-ish kind of list, if that makes sense. Um, so easy to install, curation is not necessarily a part of it. Um, and we'll look at some other ways to, to download and install software for the Raspberry Pi as well, um, because this is not always the most efficient way. Um, yes, Beagle Bones is the ones that have capes. Beagle Bones, they started around the same time as the Raspberry Pi. They tend to be a little bit more powerful, um, but have some different storage options than a Raspberry Pi, from what I understand. I haven't really played with them, to be honest. Um, um, so just to just to give you just before we get too deep into you know how do we work in this ecosystem, um, I just want to sort of shape. So the the truth is like when I'm talking to nerds and it's that's most of my life these days and I love it. Um, I'm, somebody says, "Hey, I'm I'm going to make this thing." And I go, "Awesome!" And they go, "I'm going to make it with an Arduino or with a Raspberry Pi." And there are times when I will say things like, uh, "Oh, I think that would be easier. I think that would be better." on the other thing right i think why like why are you using an arduino to do this how did you settle there or a raspberry pi or vice versa and sometimes the very honest answer is well i'm more familiar with it and i'm very guilty of this too right it's like i i will be totally honest i would say my comfort level with an arduino versus a raspberry pi definitely influences my choice of tool sometimes right there are times when it's like I just kind of need to get this thing done fast. And I, I know I could do it with a Pi, but I know Arduino a little bit better and I've kind of done it here before. That's the tool I'm going to throw at this job, right? But there are some things, um, some things that would steer me in a Raspberry Pi-ish versus an Arduino-ish direction. Um, that So like, the, so, so that, if, you know, as we're chatting, you're like, could you do this with a Raspberry Pi? And then I'm like, oh, I don't think you should use an Arduino for that. This is the list that's in my head, and now it can be, you know, in a slide for y'all. Um, so things that are easier sort of with a Raspberry Pi-like environment with its connectivity versus an Arduino-y environment, right? And none of this is hard and fast, um, but... Um, I think anything that involves networking or the internet at anything beyond a very basic level is probably going to be easier on a Raspberry Pi. Certainly anything that re that involves the internet is easier on a Pi. There are some really targeted applications um, of networking that I, I think actually are a little bit easier on an Arduino. I've talked before about a little, a little network attached device that I built for the folks at Santa Fe Opera to slurp very specific network packets off of their network that relayed some lighting information and put that information on a little screen, right? So it's a networking involved thing, but you can do basic networking on an Arduino, and it was 
targeted enough and these packets are specific enough um, that uh, that doing it in an Arduino for me at least was faster and possible. But if I had to like you know if I wanted to make a thing that was going to you know press a button and tweet right, which is, you know, reaching out to a website in a very specific way or, you know, slurping the GPS data of this guy's Kilimanjaro sensor, a Raspberry Pi is going to be easier for networking like that than an Arduino. Same with video style displays, HDMI, VGA. The very first Raspberry Pi's actually had a composite output as well. Um, that kind of driving that kind of stuff is a lot easier um, with a full operating system than it would be on an Arduino. Playing back sound, you know, in a Raspberry Pi like environment, you can load sound files into, you know, VLC media player and play them back or play them back using code programmatically. To play back sound in an Arduino environment usually requires an extra board, which essentially, you know, reads sound files off of an SD card and just shuffles them into an audio amplifier. It takes a lot of extra hardware and is not super versatile. So for playing back something in like a sound file, Raspberry Pi would be would be easier. Really anything working with files right? If you've got a text file, if you want to be able to download calendar information in a text file-like format, Raspberry Pi is going to be sort of easier for that. USB input, like a keyboard and mouse input, again, easier on the Pi. Um, cameras, working with camera data. It's not, again, something you can do with an Arduino, um, but it's just something like, you know, I could plug, I can and have plugged this USB webcam into a Raspberry Pi and it just works. Um, and that's a pretty cool factor. Um, and then just because of the larger storage size and the increased sort of processor speed of a Raspberry Pi or, so, or a single board computer, if you're going to be using something that's going to process a large amount of data, doing that in a computer-like environment can be really helpful, right? So um, let's say uh, you were doing something, you know, let's say uh, uh, you were doing a weather monitoring station that read the temperature off of something um, and then... Uh, did like a, you know, gave you like a rolling average over time, right? If you were doing a readings like every 15 minutes, right? So you're only taking maybe a hundred or readings a day. I don't know that it makes a real difference whether you're in the Raspberry Pi world or the Arduino world. Um, if you're doing a reading every quarter of a second, and now we're talking about, you know, megabytes or gigabytes of data in a very short amount of time, then yeah, somewhere that you have like gigabytes of space to work with and additional processing capabilities to process that data on, a, on something like a Pi might be a better way to go. So things that are, that's like, that seems like a lot of things like, oh, well, Raspberry Pi can kind of do it all. Why would I ever use something else? Well, things that the Arduino is either stronger at, or I think are easier to use in an Arduino. Um, dimming. So you can do uh, pulse width modulation output, analog dimming uh, on a lot of pins of the Raspberry Pi. Um, but they only some of them are what we would call hardware dimming. The others are sort of done in software and they're a little bit imprecise. So if I just need to like dim an LED, I'll do it on an Arduino every time. Um, analog input is also not a capability that the Raspberry Pi natively has. You need some additional hardware to turn analog information into digital information that the Pi can read. So it's, that's not a terribly hard thing to do, right? But, but for an application like, you know, if I'm, you know, uh, making a little dimmer circuit that you know, it reads the value on a potentiometer and dims maybe two different colors of LEDs up and down, right? The ability to like just easily read the position of that potentiometer and dim, you know, do some analog dimming on those couple of LEDs. An Arduino is just going to be, it's going to be easier to do that in an Arduino in a microcontroller environment. Um, other sort of low level analogy kind of things, motor control, controlling small displays um, manually can be easier to do on Arduino. And that I'm thinking of like, you know, little tiny LCDs or LED displays. Of course, you know, some of those bonnets and hats we looked at earlier make it easy and, and trivial to sort of snap a display onto your Pi. But for an arbitrary display where you're just sort of manually hooking control lines of LCDs into your processor, Arduino is just a, a little bit easier to by hand manipulate where those connections are happening. And then Arduino, you know, because it's, because it is a, 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 a simpler device, it's a little bit more robust in a portability sense, right? There's a, there's less going on, there's less that can go wrong in the field. Um, so for, you know, a really a portable temporary thing, um, this is going to be a little bit more robust than a, a board that is essentially, you know, a, a full computer sitting in the palm of your hand. And then there's, there's some stuff that's like, it's about the same in my estimation to do this, to, to interface between the two of them. Um, you know, reading a button, turning an LED on and off is about the same between the two. Um, basic data logging, you know, writing writing some values to memory, um, hooking up to external modules, you know, a a sensor that communicates not with the analog value but with some digital data that's flowing back into your your Arduino or your Pi is about the same between the two. So that's not a, not a huge difference. Um, 
I know this is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is just to sort of give you a sense of like, as, as I'm envisioning projects in my head at least, and everyone I'm sure has their own opinions about which of these, you know, sort of ranges of solutions is good when, if I hear that someone's planning to use uh, the internet, right? I'm thinking, oh, single board computer solution. If someone's thinking, oh, I'm going to have four or five knobs hooked up and I, you know, I, oh, man, it's probably an arduino -y thing. Of course, there's lots of projects that sort of vary between the two. You can imagine uh, a space station control center in your escape room that has a bunch of knobs and buttons and needs some dimming, but you also want to display your output on a big touch screen right, or something like that. Things that straddle the line there, you know, can be a little bit sometimes hard to tell, like what solution should I use? Um, mostly for me, if it's going to have one of these sort of single board computery features, a screen, internet or network connectivity, wireless connectivity, or use of files, it sort of, that drifts it toward a Raspberry Pi-like solution. There's also a world where you can interface a Raspberry Pi with an Arduino and kind of get the best of both worlds, right? You could have an Arduino doing a variety of uh, sensor readings and analog readings and analog control and had that sending little digital messages back and forth to a Raspberry Pi over something like a serial port or another means of communication. Um, so anyway, this is all kind of hand wavy, but just just know that that someday, dear, dear, dear listeners, dear watchers, uh, someday if you're like, hey, uh, I think I'm going to do this cool project and I'm going to do it with a Raspberry Pi and I go, you sure you don't want to do with an Arduino? It's probably because of this thought matrix in my head. And now you know it and you can use it too, I hope. I need a I need a beer sip and then then we'll carry on with some things. Yeah, Palmer, this is this is great. Ooh, Palmer says, I'm wondering, would there be a Microsoft email client for this? Ah, um, I don't know. Worth Googling. Um, I sort of missed that question earlier, Palmer. Um, but there certainly might be. I think you could also, I mean, certainly in terms of email clients specifically. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've done. Okay, so here's the thing I knew I was going to do. On the table in front of me here, I have a keyboard for the Raspberry Pi. I have a mouse for the Raspberry Pi. I have a mouse for my streaming laptop. And I have a keyboard for my laptop. And they're all on the same two screens. So many, many times in the ensuing weeks, I am sure... I will mix up which devices are meant to be for which things, and it's gonna be uh, a real adventure of a time because I have two two Mises and two keyboards to play with here. But if we go into say like the mail app, just to get back on Jack here, Palmer. Let's see, where is my mail app? I thought it came with one. Maybe it doesn't anymore. Let's see. Um, you can usually configure the. Uh, the built-in mail app to at least suck down email and send it from, say, a Microsoft account, even if there isn't, like, a native Microsoft Office um, uh, client or something. Um, let's see. But anyway, we can we can dig into that at some point. Various multimedia thing, various accessories, admin... Oh, communication. So this is, this is a little bit what I mean about, like, it doesn't have to do curation for you. It's like, this is going to be every... Excuse me every possible communication related thing that the raspberry pi you know libraries know about for now right a morse code training program the aprs digipeter and iGate software which is you know, a very niche nerdy ham radio thing and look there's two of them there's aprx hi kenneth um and aprs digi right which is a slightly different process so like you know a whole asterisk pbx module for like digital phone systems right so we could certainly find them um but i don't know them off the top of my head Palmer says, Claws Mail is an open source, ah, open source thing found in the email. See, this is what I thought, Palmer. I thought there was a pre-installed mail client, but I'm not seeing it here. Um, but we could play a little bit with getting that set up for sure. Um, let me, um, let's see here. Let me take you through, ah, so just to like, to, to, to round out the like, the fundamentalsness of, uh, of this week's episode before we get a little bit further down the rabbit hole of what you can do with a Raspberry Pi and things to start with. Let me talk just briefly, and I know this was in the video from last week, about materials you would need to get started, and then what the process of like getting started with the actual software and getting the Pi running is. Because it's not quite as simple as just taking it out of the box and plugging it in, right? So look, we'll just run through these relatively quickly. Um, so hardware you would need to get started with your Raspberry Pi, you would need your, your Raspberry Pi board itself of various stripes. Um, you would need a power supply, right? So in the case of the Raspberry Pi 
uh, four. That's a 15 watt USB C power supply. If you're using an earlier version, you'd need a 10 watt micro USB power supply. And you know, when you, if you're buying or using one of these boards, it will tell you what kind of power supply to uh, to associate with it. Um, you'll need a micro SD card. That's one of the little little tiny ones. Let me see if I've got. Oop, tummy cam. Sorry, y'all. Uh, I don't think I don't think I have one that's not sitting in the pie here. Although I guess I could show that. Um, it's a you know the little tiny micro USB. Uh, this is I think is a 16 gig card that I'm using for this guy. And you'll need some way of reading that. Um, you know, I'm modifying the files on it with an existing computer to get started. So I made you know, my laptop does not have an SD card reader. So I bought one of these. I think it was like six bucks. It's a little you know SD and micro SD card USB card reader. It's some no name brand. Um, it's the cheapest one I could find online, and it works just fine. I have this one, the SoCal Trade branded one from years ago, that also works fine. So if your computer doesn't have an SD card reader, these are a perfectly good option. Um, you would need uh, a probably a monitor. Um, to get you started with. And I should say, you know, all, all of these supplies, I've linked to the actual products that I'm going to be using for the next few weeks in the description of this stream and or video. If you wanted to buy just those or look at them as examples of what to buy and then find a cheaper option, totally good. Um, the the cheapest place to buy a Raspberry Pi 4 these days, as far as I can tell, is directly from Adafruit, which we talked about a couple weeks ago um, as an electronics vendor out of New York. Um, all the rest of these things are, are fairly generic and fairly uniformly priced, but I recommend going to Adafruit for the Pi itself. Um, for some reason, they just are, they're, they're cheaper than Amazon, they're cheaper than eBay, um, so they're, and they're, they're a good stateside vendor, so a good place to go. Um, you will, for, for the sake of experimentation, I encourage you to use a monitor. Um, there is, you, you can use a Raspberry Pi without a monitor. Um, and I think, Chris, you may have alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the Raspberry Pi is a small device that, you know, does whatever you tell it to. It can sit on your network um, and do things without having to have a monitor hooked up. And if that is your end goal, you can actually set up the Raspberry Pi from the start without using a monitor. Um, there is a link in the description to a pretty good guide as to how to get that set up. Basically, it requir requires a little bit of an extra step when you're setting up the Pi on your network so that you can basically remote desktop into it later um, without having to set a monitor up on it, which can be a kind of a handy thing, especially if you're using, you know, one of these little zeros or zero Ws. And like the more connectors you have to put on this thing, the more of a pain in the butt it is. Um, you know, in a situation where it's like, ultimately, this thing's just going to have like an HDMI screen attached to it and nothing else. You can set it up so that it just boots up, connects to Wi-Fi, and you can remote into it and not have to worry about, you know, hooking up a USB keyboard or mouse or something like that. Um, mm, Chris mentions Micro Center is a good place. That's a good thought, Chris. I haven't checked Micro Center's stocks in a long time. Um, but... Yeah, a lot of the 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 actual actual retailers, like the not Amazon, not AliExpress places, are required by their vendor contracts to offer the Raspberry Pi at specific price points. Um, in this case, like the thirty five dollars for the two gig Pi four, because that's the Pi Foundation really wants these things to be affordable and at specific price points. So a cool place to check out. Fry's Electronics would be the same. Things like that. Um, other things you might need, USB keyboard and USB mouse. Again, if you're doing this like remote into it later step, you don't necessarily need for experimentation step. I just think they're the easiest way to connect to the Pi. Um, and then a network connection, right? Either wireless or wired. Um, and either of them is pretty easy to, to hook up, um, to download new software, to connect in remotely over the internet, things like that. So that's, that's sort of the bare bone setup that you would need to get started with a Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, and so let's just do a real quick primer on how you actually, you know, you so you pull, <laughs> you pull your your brand new Raspberry Pi out of its box. This this box is years and years old, but let's say you just pulled pull this Raspberry Pi Model B five twelve <laughs> out of a box. How do you um, get from here to running a desktop environment on your Pi? There's a few very simple steps, and we'll uh, we'll walk through it now. So. Let's see here. I'm going to turn this way so I can actually turn to look at the computer. So the, the only piece of software that you will need is something called the Raspberry Pi Imager. There's a link to it in these slides. There's a link to it in the description. Um, and there's versions for uh, Windows and Mac and uh, Linux as well. But it looks basically like this. Um, let's see. What's going to be the clearest, the clearest background for this? I didn't really think that through. I think that's a pretty good one. Um, so you basically you you know you you load up your uh, your Raspberry Pi launcher system, 
Um, it's going to ask, he's going to give you basically three boxes. You're going to say, choose OS. Can we zoom this in at all? I guess not. Um, you have three boxes that say, choose OS, choose SD card, and write. Right? So once you've downloaded this, this, uh, this software, you're first going to say, choose OS. And it's going to give you a variety of choices of operating system. An operating system, remember, is just the, just the software that runs on the hardware doing things that you don't want to have to worry about. Right? So the bit of software that's constantly running on your hardware that knows how to interface with an Ethernet port in a really basic way. Um, that knows um, how, what a mouse is and what a pointer is. Um, and how to handle the interplay of um, various uh, components of the system that all need little bits of time here and there to keep their functionality going. Um, that's sort of at a, at a basic level what this is. Um, if you're just getting started, the Raspberry Pi OS is the good one to start with. It's the first option on the list here. Um, you may have, if you've, if you've worked with Raspberry Pi before, this used to be called Raspbian. Um, is now called Raspberry Pi OS. They're the same thing. Um, they just changed the name over time. So Raspberry Pi OS is now the default standard. And there's a few other options in here. There's Ubuntu Linux, if you're familiar with Linux flavors. There's various other distributions like the RetroPie, which is a, a distribution, an operating system that's specifically for these like video game emulation products that you can just you know, download that whole hog and make your Raspberry Pi one of those. Um, this Kodi Entertainment Center is one of these like media streaming service centers that you can put on your Pi. But for our purposes, we'll just choose the Raspberry Pi OS. And, and sorry, I know that the text is real small there. I apparently cannot zoom in on this. Um, we click on Raspberry Pi OS. We would choose our SD card that's attached to our computer You know, in our SD card reader. Mine, of course, is currently running the Pi, so I'm going to skip this step. And then you would click write. And over the course of, you know, maybe 10 minutes, it takes a little bit of time to format an SD card. You basically burn the whole operating system onto your micro SD card, right? You come back, they'll say, hey, it's successful. And it will verify at the end that the copying went successfully. Um, it'll pop you up with a nice message that says, hey, you did it. Congratulations. Um, and you can move on to the next step, which is... Um, so we've downloaded the Raspberry Pi imager. We use the imager to install Raspbian. You see, even in the slides, I called it Raspbian. It's now Raspberry Pi OS onto the micro SD card. You basically plug in all of your connections to your Raspberry Pi, right? So you plug in, in you know, a USB keyboard and mouse is really helpful. You plug in your, your micro, in my case, micro HDMI to HDMI, uh, uh, cable. Uh, and then you plug in your, your nice 15 watt power supply. You also need to have your SD card, your, your newly imaged micro SD card into the slot in the back there and that will click nicely into place when it comes up um and then once you once you've done that here i'll show you i'm gonna this and then this is one of those moments where we'll see if the streaming software freaks out but i'm gonna unplug the uh the power cable from my pi and plug it back in and we'll get to watch. hopefully we'll get to watch the pi boot in real time um and we'll just see what it does yeah there we go that's a good sign so we get that nice rainbow screen we get our little our little four raspberries up there as our raspberry pi boots it thinks about what it's done. It's made some choices. This is actually the part where it's starting its graphical user interface. So in a Windows or Mac-like environment, we're used to thinking of like, you know, what the Windows 7 desktop looks like or what the Mac OS X desktop looks like is what the computer is in a, in a, in a big way. It's like, oh, that's that, that, you know, the thing with the Finder and the Applications window, that's what a Mac is. Um, but in a Linux environment, in a, in a Raspberry Pi environment, there is actually, there can be a distinction between the software that's showing you what's going on in the computer and what the computer is actually doing. So, so that is all to say this, you know, this software that's running, that's allowing me to move my mouse, that is showing me a background, that's giving me the ability to click on things and show menus, is itself a piece of software or a collection of software and you can change there are multiple options for what that software is and you can change it if you want to so i believe by default raspberry pi oes uses something called uh the gnome desktop that's why in this add or move program software you see this gnome desktop here you also have like the kde desktop and the xe desktop and these are just other versions of software that emulate that sort of implement this desktop metaphor for how we access the data and programs in a computer and in this environment you can choose a different one and they all have you know various strengths and and, and weaknesses and disadvantages to be honest uh, you know the way that i interact with the raspberry pi it doesn't usually make a huge difference to me which one i'm in um but interesting you can also run the computer without one right? You, you don't necessarily, if your computer is just going to be, you know, listening for data over the network and spitting data back, say, why bother having software running that's like controlling an HDMI port? 
right? If I'm not going to have a monitor hooked up, who cares what that software is? So we can do away with this graphical user interface entirely if we want to. Um, so you see, so I, I plug in the SD card, I boot up the Raspberry Pi. The very first time you boot your Pi up, it will give you some options like, what language do you want this to be in? What is your keyboard layout? Um, do you want to connect to a network? In fact, I wonder if I can connect to a network. Yeah, so there's my network, the slow cooker. Um, and it's a various other people, not the FBI, that's very comforting. The Wi-Fi Club is apparently one of my neighbors. Um, so you can connect to, you know, uh, Wi-Fi natively, you can catch a, a Bluetooth device natively. Bluetooth on these things can be really helpful if you're building a little tiny portable solution, right? So you could have a, a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse setup instead of a USB one it can be kind of cool. Um, and then you'd obviously you'd want to set the time. As Chris has pointed out, that would be a good thing to do. Um, but uh, but yeah, then you're then you're off to the races and running. Um, Chris says getting the right keyboard can be tough. You know, I, I historically have had that issue too. This time I just said use US default keyboard or US English default keyboard, and it just worked. So I, I feel pretty fortunate there. Um, and now we're we're off to the races with a with a Raspberry Pi. Here, I'll tell you what, I don't think you're gonna be able to see my password. Let me um let me just log into this and I can show you that the web browser does indeed work. If I can remember my password. So there we go. Um, issues with two characters being switched. Ooh, that's very specific, Chris. Let's see if this is hooked up here. Open the Chromium web browser. We'll see if uh, we'll see if this connection is has enabled itself. Here we go. Tab Chromium, loading up the web store. Let's go to Google. Oh, your clock is behind. <laughs> well, that's a handy feature. Yes, please update my date and time. <laughs> Internet. That's so funny. I've never seen that before. Computer's date and time are behind. I wonder why that is. Ah, I'll have to go in. I'll have to, figure, I'll have to do some Googling and figure out how to go go in and fix that because apparently it's not in digital clock settings. Um, but well, no, we'll figure that out at some point. Oop, 21. Oh, that looks more right. Let's try that again. There we go. So now I've got Google, right? So you know, a little Wi-Fi configuration, update my clock, and now I have you know a web browser. And I could, I could go to, while well, this is going to be meta, I could go to jeff.glass. My own website. We'll see if this works. This is, I'm just doing this all live. We'll see if we'll see what happens. Oh, hey, look at that. Hey, it's my website. And hey, I should really retitle this from from Arduino classes to weekly electronics classes. And I could see, oh, there's my page on the the Raspberry Pi. And I could load up the uh, the circuit diagrams. Ooh, and then I could load up my slides from this week. Um, and I could see what Jeff was talking about and like find all those links. Um, so yeah, so I, just, I have a little computer running. So really, so <laughs> this is all to say, the setup and install process should be fairly simple. And these four steps should be all you need. Of course, in the real world, nothing is perfect. So in the description of this stream and our video are a couple of links to what I think are pretty decent troubleshooting guides for some of the more common problems. Um, a lot of them have to do, or at least, well, at least what I've experienced is problems with uh, displays and screens, like your Raspberry Pi not successfully talking to your HDMI monitor about what resolution it is or what color space it is or so on. So there's a whole guide on that down below, as well as some of the other common problems um, that you might run into. Um, the one last thing that I want to show you um, sort of before we, um, we move on from this evening is um, a lot of these troubleshooting guides are going to have you running code in the terminal. Um, so I want to show you just really briefly how to do that should you need that as a troubleshooting step. Um, so, so, hey, this is going to be really meta. Um, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to need the link uh, to uh, to that troubleshooting guide because that'll be a good example. Um, so I, I'm going to go to YouTube and go to this stream live in this stream, which I don't think is going to work very well because I'm currently connected to the Pi via Wi-Fi. Um, the Wi-Fi in my workshop here is not very good. Um, but I'm going to go to this stream live and pull the link from my own stream. Um, now I, I could do it from like, I could go into the management software of my laptop here, but this is so much more fun. Um, so we'll go to the, we'll go to the webpage here. Um, we'll scroll down and we'll see, uh, here troubleshooting guide for Raspberry Pi. We'll open that up. Hey, look, there I am scrolling down to the, to the, uh, the page for Raspberry Pi. Should we leave this open for a second and see how many of me's, uh, figure out to go down to the, the page for Raspberry Pi. Hey, look, there's a little me again. <laughs> Let's get one more little me. Hey, there's one more little me. Okay, that's good enough. Um, so if we're in one of these Raspberry Pi troubleshooting guides, and I think I think this is the one I mean. Um, let's see. Oh, here. Let's uh, let's open the one on display uh, display troubleshooting. And I'll show you what I mean about troubleshooting via the terminal and how you would get to that. 
Yeah, we're chug a lugging here because I'm on I'm on Wi-Fi and pretty far from my from my router back on the office here. We'll go into our display. Troubleshoot a link from the link of my own slide. This just I just makes me laugh. Like this is, I this, there, there's easier ways to do this and get this information, but I'm really enjoying doing it this way. Okay, so here's a good example, right? So um, you know, maybe you're working through this troubleshooting guide because you have um, you know, troubles hooking up your Raspberry Pi to your HDMI display, and you're scrolling through this guide and you come to something like this. Right, so um, you can, you know, it says, have you updated your Raspberry Pi? If not, many problems will be solved by making sure your software is up to date. Uh, connecting to a network and run the following. What does that exactly mean, right? So what they're showing you here is various commands, various things to type into your terminal, which you can find in your top bar here. It's this little black screen with a carrot, um, or I think in, in accessories, yeah, you can open a terminal screen. And that will open you this little text-based interface, which can do basically anything you can do in the graphical user interface and a little bit more, right? So when it says, you know, connect to a network and run the following or run the following commands, you're going to type exactly what it says here into your terminal. So in this case, I would type sudo apt, wow, I'm going to have to work on scaling up the font on that, huh? sudo apt update. Right, and we'll. I'm sure we'll talk more about the the terminal and what it is at some point. Um, but just to give you like a little brief preview of what that is, sudo or super user do is basically a prefix that says, "Hey computer, uh, I am the lord of the universe for the sake of this conversation. Even if I'm asking you to do a thing that you wouldn't normally allow me to do and try and keep me safe from, no, I really mean it. Do it." apt is a program that deals with the installation removal and upgrading of programs and if you just run uh apt update it's basically saying hey apt this program that is responsible for like downloading and up installing new programs update make sure all my software is up to date please it's kind of like wanting a windows update but for everything right um then you could also you could install you know use this sudo apt install and install other software via the command line. That might be a useful troubleshooting step for you. You can also reboot the computer from the command line here. Um, so, and then as we get down further and further into the troubleshooting options, you can see um, there's lots of other things you can do via the command line. Like, um, like if your screen is upside down, right? Especially if you're on an LCD screen. Um, let's see if we can find this. So in this case, I would type in, I know you can't see that little tiny text. I'll work on that for next week. Um, sudo nano slash boot slash config dot txt right nano is a text editor that's built into the terminal here this is actually so small that i can't see it so i don't know this is going to go great um but if we go down and try and find our our lcd rotate variable here which is actually too small for me to see on my on my screen as it currently exists but presumably we could go in and you know modify that variable and, and make things work okay and and so on and so forth so if you're getting <laughs> and I, i'm i'm sad for you a little bit if you if you end up down this road but part of working with software and hardware is troubleshooting and taking joy in it so just know that if something says you know run this command and you especially if you see something like sudo or um something like cat or something you are um, you are meant to run those commands in the terminal. And so what you would do is open up the terminal program and type in exactly what they have shown you. Um, this official demo, of course, has done some nice formatting to make it really clear that that's you know, just with like color theming that that's what they intend you to do. Um, other examples might just say something like, hey, uh, run sudo apt-get update install software and not really sort of preface that you're meant to run it in the terminal. Um, but if you're, if it's asking you to run commands, you usually mean to, you know, run it in the terminal as it were. Oh yeah. Watching on a TV. I don't know if, uh, if my, my California gang is here tonight. I know they usually watch on a big screen TV. So that might be, um, <laughs> Palmer has a 24 inch screen. Well, that's pretty fantastic. Mine's on about a 17 inch monitor. So maybe, maybe for next week, we'll just, we'll kit out the back wall with a big flat screen TV. And then we can, you know, I can really see what's going on and you can enjoy the real reflectiveness of what's going on in the sort of back of head zone these days for my sake. Um, so in any case, if you haven't installed uh, Raspberry Pi OS on your SD card, it, it, it's amazingly simple. Like this whole Raspberry Pi imager program that they've come up with in the past couple of years makes it pretty easy and foolproof. Um, the common issues are identified in those couple of troubleshooting guides. Um, Chris uses PuTTY to connect to his Pi terminal. Yeah, so that's, that's a way of um, connecting to your Pi over the network without the need for a graphical user interface. And like I say, if you, you can also connect to your Pi over the network 
using a graphical user interface, using something that's very much like remote desktop. Uh, and there's a guide in the description of this link of this uh, stream and or video um, if you want to go that route as well. Um, but, so I, I encourage you to, to do the easy route if this is your first time playing around. Uh, but if it's not, just know that those options exist in the future if you want to play around with them. Um, yes. So... Um, that is the the bulk of what we're talking about this evening, but I want to give you a little taste of what I think what I think is coming up uh, in the next few weeks uh, as we talk about Raspberry Pi stuff. Um, so the the first thing I want to talk about, I think, just just to like get us a little bit on parity with the skills that we've built up with um, with our Arduinos over the past like 20 weeks um, is like basic digital inputs and outputs, right? So how do you blink an LED? How do you use a switch? Um, because that already starts to like separate us a little bit from something that we could, you know, at this point we have a desktop, it's got a word editor, it's got an internet connection, but how is that really that different from like my PC or my MacBook, right? Well, once we can start really easily hooking switches and indicator lights to it, now we start to like turn some gears. Like that's kind of a, a cool and different thing we could do. Um, to do that, we're going to have to learn a little bit of a new programming language. We're going to do a lot of our work on the Raspberry Pi in Python. Uh, or in Circuit Python, which is basically Python with some additional libraries that we're going to install um, that allow easy cut, excuse me, easy connectivity to things like LEDs and switches and servos and things like that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna learn a little bit of Python. That might take some time. And uh, all this, I don't quite in my mind have the the scope of what we're gonna try and do each and every week in my mind yet. So just to like rough it all in, um, <laughs> Palmer says Python. No, no Palmer, no. Um, as we, uh, just like rough in a scope of what we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about Python. We're going to talk a little bit about digital inputs and outputs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about internet connectivity. Um, we're going to explore a little bit sort of generally like how you would pull down a web page in code and read it and look for some information in it. Um, and also like how you might connect to something like Twitter to make uh, a device that would like tweet for you, um, or receive tweets and act upon them. Um, we're going to look a, uh, a little bit at some of like how you would do this, like remote access, like how you would, um, use something like putty or a secure shell to remote into your device and configure it over the network, either with a text-based editor or with a graphical editor. Um, cause that really opens up, you know, if you have your Raspberry Pi stapled behind your monitor in your kitchen, doing your digital calendar, you really don't want to pry that thing off the wall and plug a keyboard and mouse into it every time you want to configure it. It'd be awfully nice if we could just like leave it hooked up to a network and make all of our adjustments over the network. And we'll, we'll take a look at how to do that. Um, and then we'll probably get a little deeper into like the programming side of things. Like this is partly a, a cool excuse to get like to talk about Python. Um, and using Python and some other languages to like do data processing, um, do user interactivity and various things in a way that we haven't really yet. Um, so that's like the very rough sketch of where I think we're going in the next handful of weeks. Um, if I'm doing my job right, and I guess, you know, my boss is me for all of these things, I'm trying deliberately to bite off slightly less uh, of a topic each week than I did in the first few weeks of those, uh, the early days of Electronics Bash, where, you know, two and a half, three hours was not uncommon. I mean, even in the past couple of weeks was not uncommon. Um, now that I am back at my full-time day job, uh, that kind of scope um, becomes a little bit more daunting. So I'm going to try and keep it to a slightly a slightly more concise and focused and maybe an actual 90 minutes each week. Although, you know, I guess that's what I said week one of the Arduino thing too. And uh, well, we all saw how that worked out. Um, but that's going to kind of be the goal. And as always, I'm, I'm always interested to hear what kind of things you are interested in learning or hearing about. Um, the world of Raspberry Pi with all of its functionality, I would say is bigger than the world of Arduino. So there is a really good chance if you're like, ooh, how could you do this? Um, is that a thing? I, I will certainly honestly, will probably be like, I don't know, but probably. And then we can go out and learn it together or I, we can, I can take it away and learn it. We can talk about it the following week. So I'm always I'm always really curious what what y'all are interested in. And, and, you know, Chris, thank you for volunteering some of the projects that you're doing with Pi. It's always really cool to hear what people are already doing with this kind of, this kind of um, hardware and software. It's, it's really fun. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so that, that's why I think where, I think where we're going, I, I will be totally honest. Like I have a less clear, and when I started Electronics Bash with the Arduino stuff, I had like a fairly, you know, clear vision of what the first like six to eight weeks were going to look like. And now I have like a big, like paint smear in my mind that feels like it's about six weeks long to get started with, but I have no idea how it breaks down. So 
I'll keep posting, you know, the I'll schedule the streams, we'll see what they're about, and we'll 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 take little bites off of this big big delicious pie and we'll we'll eat it one bite at a time. Um and I'm really excited. I'm excited to be honest to talk about Python um and other programming languages um and doing like text processing and data processing, um, you know, slurping down uh, you know, uh a thousand of your tweets and analyzing them or something like that, or you know, downloading uh, a news article and doing an auto translation on it um or like just like automatically launching a, a google chrome from uh you know from a from a program or something like that so i'm sure we'll find some fun things to do there as well as like interactivity servo motor control digital io and things um and we'll have a, a good old time with that um so with that i, I think we're going to come in like at a, a real real 90 minutes for maybe the first time since march uh, which is when we started. So so I think we'll just do like the ending business here. As always, thank you so much for tuning in on these Sunday nights. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Um, I hope, you know, it, it is a, a privilege to be here and I hope you're using it to, to find a place of strength to go out and continue doing good things in the world. If you have questions, comments, issues, or concerns, you can leave a comment on this video or always find me on Twitter at Jeffers Glass. Slides, as I said, and links for all this are in the description of this video and on the website jeff.glass slash electronics bash. Um, you are all great. I know I left right into the, uh, the ending without asking for questions. Um, GPO pins. Yeah, we'll get into GPO. If not next week, then the week after Chris, that's going to be a huge, like how hooking up a physical switch to a computer instantly, something you can't do on your MacBook, right? It'll be a lot of fun. Um, you are all great. You're all tremendous. Uh, keep hydrating, keep drinking tasty beers. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it's, it's a wild world out there, y'all, but I so enjoy coming in here on these Sunday nights and talking and learning and nerding out with all of you. Um, and with that, I, uh, I've been Jeff Glass. I will see you all next Sunday night. Thank you so much.